with us and Jesus being revealed as the Son of God. And today we're going to be looking at the baptism of the Lord. But before that, I just open in prayer. Lord, we give you thanks and praise from our hearts. You are our Father that wants the best for us. You're so faithful to us, be with your children and have a relationship with us so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. Just a thought on the current events before we begin. We keep telling each other that these are strange times, unprecedented, not normally one to worry about. Having a few problems here. Not normally one to worry about the future as I know Jesus is coming back. And I didn't think it would be any time soon. And if it was, then that's a bonus. It was only when I tried to buy a bacon sandwich a couple of months ago that I went out to the van outside the work and it said, no cash, credit card only. As shops beginning to complain about dirty money. Is this the beginning where we're not able to buy or sell with cash and becoming a cashless society? Jesus may be coming back sooner than I thought, but that was just a thought to ponder on. But let's get back to this week. Before we begin this week's look into the baptism of the Lord, I just want to touch a little bit on what Pastor Sean spoke about last week. And if you hadn't heard it, I strongly recommend that you listen to it on, on this website. In Matthew 2, the Magi came to Jerusalem and said, where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and I've come to worship him. And in verse 3, it states, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. That got me thinking all week. Now, I can understand King Herod being worried about this situation, Leaders and rulers wanted to hang on to their leadership as long as possible. And we see this in many countries today. And Herod was no different. He sees Jesus as a threat to his authority and leadership, and one that will possibly replace him as king one day. But what about all of Jerusalem? It doesn't say parts of Jerusalem or a particular branch of faith. It says all of Jerusalem was disturbed with him. Jerusalem and its religious leaders know there's going to be a Messiah. And God has spoken and foretold these events. Everything is going to be restored. The king is coming. They begin to think about their own situation. And thinking about past wars and their past histories. And what's that revealed to them? When rulers are removed, there's usually a war. Upheaval is imminent. And that usually comes with tragedies and many deaths. But at this moment, life is good for them. They're not at war. They've got food, clothing and shelter. And the last thing they want is upheaval. Yes, they may believe that a Messiah is coming to save them. But you know what? Not today, please. Life is good. Although we're talking about God with us, many nations, including the city of Jerusalem, have possibly saying do we want God with us life is good we don't want any change thank you very much move forward 2,000 years later and life is good why would I possibly want any change in my circumstances I've got everything I need you just have to go ask somebody in town or your friends they've got everything they need they don't want life to change you've got everything at hand so when I look at the dictionary and look at the word epiphany, it tells me that there's to me there's more than that. Um, the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles is represented by the Magi is one. And then it's this, a moment of sudden and great revelation or realization. And when we look at the baptism of Jesus, we realize that scriptures are being fulfilled. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah 40, verse 3, a voice of one calling, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And in Malachi 3, 1, 
I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord God Almighty. Both scriptures refer to John the Baptist fulfilling the prophecy, making way for the Messiah. But there's much more to it than that. The baptism of Jesus was a great revelation. So we're going to turn now to Mark chapter 1, verses 4 to 11. Mark 1, verses 4 to 11. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. This gives me a little time to look at John the Baptist briefly. Not only was this event foretold in the Old Testament, but now Luke mentions his birth in chapters 1, verse 11 to 13. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah goes on to question the angel, how could this be? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel is Gabriel. And because of Zechariah's unbelief, he is unable to talk until the birth of his son. And I just thought to myself, wouldn't it be all, all absolutely awesome to meet the angel Gabriel? Frightening, yes, but wow. Moving on, unlike Jesus, People came to see John, whereas Jesus went out to the people. But what does Jesus say about John? In Matthew 11, verse 11, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So what didn't John do? He didn't ask for a monthly sus subscription like the TV evangelists. And he didn't keep hold of his, of his authority longer than he needed to. And like other rulers love to do, they just like to hang on in there. But John's disciples came to him and said, look, Jesus is also baptizing. And John had to explain to his disciples by liking it to a bridegroom. The friend attends the bridegroom and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears him. And John then says, he must become greater and I must become less. He doesn't want to hold on to that authority and the um, ministry that he's got. There's a time and place and Jesus is here. The scripture in Mark 1 begs the question, why would Jesus need baptizing when John was preaching the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Jesus was sinless, and that can be found in many scriptures, Old and New Testament. 1 John 3 verse 5 says, but you know that he appeared 
so that he might take away our sins and in him is no sin. Also in Isaiah 53 verse 9, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, Jesus said it's right for John to baptize me to fulfill all righteousness. So God is confirming that he's with us. He's declaring his son to the world. God's spirit is sending upon Jesus, equipping his son for the work to be done. These are indeed great events. The Trinity is revealed in these verses. But now the gloves are off. There are battles to be won. There's no time for hanging around. At this baptism, there is no pomp and ceremony or crowns or where thousands of people turn up the day before to get a good seat and afterward everyone sits down to a banquet. Look what happens next. The mission has begun. In Matthew 1 verses 12 and 13, at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals and angels attended him. Jesus replies to Satan in response to the temptations with the word of God with well-known verses in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus could have responded with his own reply but he knows how powerful the word of God is as it says in Hebrews 4 12 13 for the word of God is alive and active sharper than any double-edged sword it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give account. Did anybody see the series of Michael Palin in North Korea? I loved it. It was a fascinating series and it took a long time for Michael to get access to North Korea and he had a North Korean crew with him all the time. But what puzzled Michael was when he came across the border into North Korea, there were strict guidelines, permits, documentation, and it's one of those places where you just can't go on holiday. Believe me, you probably wouldn't want to go on holiday. And when he approached customs, you wouldn't, you would think that after they checked his documents and sent him on his way. But what surprised him was the question, do you have a Bible with you? It wasn't because they were hungry for the word of God or wanted a Bible study. They wanted to take that Bible away if he had one. They know what the word of God is capable of doing. They see their fellow Koreans willing to die for Christ, standing firm against the dictator that is worshipped. And today, Christians appear to be under fire and persecuted from all directions, some of it very subtle, but a lot of it blunt. We can see China clamping down hard along with many other countries, pastors imprisoned and authorities closing down churches. And after reading these reports, my personal opinion is that the persecuted church is getting stronger in the harshest of conditions. I might be wrong. And I read a report from Release Partners stating North Korea is one of the harshest environments in the world for Christians. Believers have viewed the coronavirus though as an act of God that opens new opportunities. Can you believe that? It states in Release International Partner, partner they say 2020 has been the most creative year we have witnessed in the underground church to date. And during 2020, Despite the COVID restrictions, release partners were able to double their distribution of Bibles to Christians in North Korea. That is quite remarkable. But I've been digressing, so we're going to move on to our next reading in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 7. Acts 19, verses 1 to 7. It says this, while Apollos was in Corinth... Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they replied, no. But we have then he said, into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. 
And Paul said, don't baptize with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. And that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. The 12 men needed direction. And Paul gave them instruction, reminding them that John's message was to tell the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, and that is Jesus. God's plan is to have a relationship with us, and he knows that we need direction. That's why we have pastors, to make sure we're heading in the right direction. We need to be under authority. And a lot of responsibility lays with the pastors of the churches. We can't afford to take the wrong route, to be led in a different direction through the scriptures that we might interpret incorrectly we're also told to encourage each other and keep meeting together and we have to keep moving in the same direction we cannot do church by ourselves depending on our own strengths and if you do go it alone then the direction you take may well be a different one that god's intended for you it reminds me when i was 15 and i waved goodbye to my parents at the train station and joined the junior leaders regiment. We were trained as young soldiers to do many things and one of which was to march a platoon of men, giving them directions to move in a particular direction, to stop and to start, turn left, turn right. Their ears had to be very attentive. If one of them missed the call to halt, then it would stand out like a salt and as 35 men would stop and one man carries on causing desolation to the group. Reminding me of Baldrick. It works the other way too. If the instructor gets confused with his left and right, they'll be heading at, they'll be heading toward the chip shop or marching into the ceremonial cannons. Looking at this passage in Acts 19, we see Paul's first question to the 12 disciples. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? The negative answer probably leads Paul on to ask, how much they know about Jesus Christ. They had taken the first step by being baptized into John's baptism, but that's not enough. Nobody had taught them about Jesus until they met Paul, and they had not heard about the Lamb of God or heard of the Holy Spirit. Paul explained the Christian message of salvation and baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus, and Paul had hand them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke in tongues and prophesied, and that's when their lives turned around. They are born again by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Nothing will ever be the same again. That doesn't mean to say it's the end of the journey for them. Their, their adventure's only just begun. Yes, they are born again, and the pit has been opened, and they've been lifted out. They are now children of God, children of the living God. No one can pluck them out of God's hand. They might not yet know the plan of God or what he has for them, but I think they soon will, as God has got a plan for everybody in Christ, no matter whom they are. The Holy Spirit gives birth to your spirit. The Apostle says this in Romans 8, 8 to 11. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not believe the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ but if Christ is in you then even your body is subject to death because of sin the spirit gives life because of righteousness and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you Jesus explained this in a simple way to Nicodemus in John 3, 1, 7. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born again when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. 
Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Because flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. You see, this is plain and simple. We can't enter the kingdom of God unless we're born again of the Holy Spirit. It's not up for discussion. And we can't say, look, I've done nothing wrong in my life. I haven't committed any crimes. I've, I've handed out all my money. I've been a really good person. Unfortunately, it means nothing. God is with us. We are a new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. God is with us. The new is here. But what are we doing with the new? Are we interceding on behalf of others? Are we helping others? Are we making a difference in people's lives? Are we connecting with God? Or are we pushing aside our new life? And just taking a break for a while. Looking back at my own childhood, I suppose I was the black sheep of the family. I lived half of my life without Jesus. And my life changed at the age of 32 when I first believed. Because somebody was bold enough to tell me about Jesus. I was in the army and in the fast track for promotion as a warrant officer at 32. And my life and priorities were turned upside down, literally upside down. No longer was I thinking of leaving my family and retiring as a, a single man by a river full of fish living off my pensions. What a, what a life that would be. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I was and I'm a new creation. I think the reporting officers weren't too keen on my gentle approach now to life. Surprisingly, I didn't get promoted again. Earthly things such as promotions, they pass away. I should have been looking, I should have been looking at eternal things that do not rot or pass away. God is with us. Being spirit filled is not fiction. It wasn't fiction 2000 years ago and it's not fiction now. There's no turning back. What we have is more beautiful than diamonds and more precious than gold. And as I get closer to that retirement age, <clears throat> I get the feeling that I will not be putting up my feet to rest as God will always have a plan to use me. But that's only if I'm willing to be used. If anyone that does not know Christ has been listening, whether it be today or next week or next month, my question to you is this. Do you want to know the Lord Jesus Christ? He did actually die on the cross for your sin and mine. He was buried and rose again, victorious on the third day. He continually, he's continually coming into and changing people's lives, just like mine. So do you want Jesus to change your life? Because it's a game changer. If you do, then I ask you to pray this simple prayer. You don't have to say it out loud. You just have to, in your heart, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. He does change lives. He is an amazing God and he loves you and he wants a relationship with you. He's leading us forward and he is good God. And before I hand back over to Pastor Sean, just a closing prayer. Lord, we just, we just thank you for who you are. You have our concerns. They mean so much to you. You're showing your love constantly. 
and mostly by just let you gave your son for us lord that we might live live forever and not be living a life of our own just to please ourselves lord we're just thankful that we are in your family and we praise you we praise you lord for the opportunities that you've given us and the many many blessings that you've given us in our lives continually blessing us so we thank you lord we thank you in jesus name we pray amen